Welcome to this fellows conversation. I'm Sarita Amrute. My pronouns are she and her. Principal researcher at Data and Society and director of the fellowship program. For anyone unfamiliar with Data and Society, we're an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. Data and Society began in New York City, an island node in a large network of hills, rivers, and mountains in the Atlantic Northeast, known as Lenape Hoking, the ancestral land of the Lene Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via a different network, a vast array of servers, humans, and computers. In the United States, much of this system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereign sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the world. We commit to dismantling all ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. It gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce to you today our fellows class this year and to tell you a little bit about why we started this fellowship program at Data and Society. The Data and Society Race and Tech Fellows Program has been running for two years now. And one of the things that I really wanted to do when I started this program is to highlight the important intersection between uh, initially race and technology, but we've expanded this year to include questions of caste and indigeneity when it comes to thinking through current technologies and their futures. And I thought this discussion was incredibly important because I wanted to do two things. I wanted to move us out of a deficit framework when thinking about race, caste, indigeneity, and technology on the one hand. That is, I wanted to move us away from treating formerly colonized people, caste oppressed people, indigenous people, uh, formerly enslaved people as always victims of technological harms. And on the other hand, I wanted to platform the amazing work by scholars of color happening in this field. So I'm very excited today to introduce you to our fellows. Uh, we have with us this year Chaz Arnett, Morali Shanmugavelan, Tamara Napper, and Tiara Roxanne, who will be talking to us about their work. And I'm going to throw out the first question for everybody. Our first question is, what drew your interest to this fellowship? And what's your experience been like? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and thanks um, for that. Uh great introduction and, and um, I'm hoping that this, this conversation, um, you know, dovetails into to, um, how we have been spending uh, most of the, the, the last year and, and, and talking and, and enjoying each other's company. Um, so I, I think before I applied to um, the faculty fellowship, I had, I was familiar with it. I think I've seen people posting about it on online and seeing uh, something of interest. But I think what really um, drew me in uh, was when the focus became one on race, race and technology. Um, and that was sort of right up, right up my alley. So I thought that it would be a good opportunity for a, a couple of uh, reasons. I was craving sort of interdisciplinary um, engagement, conversation, and, and community building. Um, I felt siloed in um, sort of legal academic uh, circles, um, and sort of knowing that my work sort of branched out of that uh, that bubble and, and, and touched so many other areas. So I was sort of craving that. Um, and, and you know, I, obviously the general sort of focus of race and technology was something that I was uh, thinking heavily about, um, and. Uh, I think I was also looking for an opportunity to, to shape um, an idea that I was mulling over um, and that the fellowship would give me sort of the, the, the framework to, 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 to think about that. And, you know, through this uh, fellowship, I've uh, certainly had things that I expected um, transpire, which was, uh, you know, beginning to build community, um, having the chance to amplify my work in the data and tech space. But there were also things that I didn't um, expect uh, that that took place, and I, th I think that's the result of of my co-fellows and uh, also Tiara, who joined us uh, later in the year as 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 well. And I think that has forced me um, 
to think about things outside of my intended project, right? I think our conversations, our collaborations uh, has forced me to think about um, some other projects that I'm working on that I had, you know, that I, that I thought and viewed as separate from this fellowship, um, which has been great. Um, sort of um, interacting with, uh, you know, Samara has, has, has forced me to think about my connections outside of like my narrow focus on CRIM um, and, and how some of uh, the way that I'm, my, some of my writing and the ways that I'm approaching this has, has you know, implications for other areas outside of CRIM law. Uh, Morally has, you know, his, his focus um, on development of uh, curricula uh, has, has forced me to think differently about how I approach my uh, classes and teaching and how that should interplay with my scholarship. Um, and Tiara most recently, um, has helped me learn more. I've, I've never really thought about data and tech issues from the perspective of indigeneity, excuse me, um, or indigenous people's perspective. So that has been refreshing. So, yeah. You know, I always approach everything. Uh, I probably always start everything with race and I've been doing, you know, race scholarship and teaching courses on race in college for about 22 years now. And um, it was in the last maybe so many years I started becoming more interested in the role of technology and big data. And that's really kind of what started my interest in um, thinking about credit scoring. And I was building on existing work I had done on the racial wealth gap and on kind of banking. And I wanted just to kind of be in conversation more with people who are doing race and technology studies. So I'm very fortunate that I have enough people, you know, kind of an intellectual community and there's plenty of people I know who are doing really good solid race work, but as far as kind of making these connections between race, big data and technology, um, you know, I was, I'm interested in kind of building more of an intellectual community to kind of think through my work. And I had also been teaching classes at um, the college I'm employed at that, you know, was thinking about the issue of big data and technology. And I, you know, didn't really have a lot of colleagues to kind of think about some of that work with. So that's what I, you know, um, one of the reasons why I applied for the fellowship. And then originally I was thinking about, you know, doing all these kind of interviews and stuff on credit scoring and issues around governance and regulation and just the lack of kind of um, strong regulation of the credit scoring industry. But over time, while I was here, I started to really understand I needed stronger methodological skills. And so that led to kind of some of the work um, that, uh, you know, we'll talk about later, I'm sure, in this conversation about uh, my kind of interest in co-developing a methodology workshop to strengthen that, so. Yeah, um, thank you, Tamara and Chaz, for sharing what you've shared so far, and Sudita for the amazing introduction. I'm so honored to be a part of this conversation. I just started in February, basically, as a postdoc in Trustworthy Infrastructures. So the reason, you know, that I was really drawn to this fellowship and data and society, kind of along with what Chaz and Tamara have already stated is interdisciplinary um, thinking and community centered practices or methodologies as well in thinking together, um, but also specifically from my own perspective of, of indigeneity and, and being a Tadaskan Mestitsa who has worked with data colonialism or has critiqued um, data mining extraction from an indigenous perspective, um, looking at data colonialism for the past six years. The postdoc, you know, in trustworthy infrastructures really provides space for me to expand my research. So moving from data colonialism and critiquing why it's so important for indigenous, you know, communities to assert their voices and and also in these spaces, but also put their their own experience into practice when it comes to data mining or just working in technology, for example, whatever that means. Um, it's just so important to be thinking about trust and safety online from these perspectives. And this postdoc is allowing me to do that um, in a way that feels um, very supported. And especially in these conversations that I've had with Chaz and Sarita, you know, Tamara and, and Murali, it's just been wildly generative for me. I'm learning so much every week all the time that I, I feel like I can't even catch up with 
um, you know, wanting to write more and think more through trust and safety online um, from indigenous perspectives. So that's kind of been my experience so far in the very short time that I've been here. And again, I just, I feel so honored to be able to be in a space where I can expand my work, um, you know, especially working from Berlin and, and, and remotely at Data and Society has been just a, the best opportunity. So I'm really grateful. It's really hard to imagine you've only been here since February. It, it's just amazing to me. Um, you're just such a huge part of the group. Kind of, um, Murali, do you want to add? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for um, having me and uh, for having me you know, as a fellow. Um, I'm delighted to be here and uh, it's very hard to add anything more concrete and creative at the end, but um, I can only start with an anecdote. Probably several years ago, I went to New York and I had um, a long conversation uh, with um, someone at the senior level of a similar institute, which shall remain nameless for this purpose of this conversation. Um, <clears throat> and this particular institute is sort of similar to data and society's uh, agenda, technology, development, democratic participation. And we had a lovely chat. And this gentleman, um, at the end of the conversation, he wanted to, uh, in a sense, um, show off his knowledge about where I come from. So he started asking me saying, um, you must be a Brahmin because I know that lots of Brahmin from Inter Indian Institute of Technologies are extremely uh, brilliant. And I've been to Chennai several times, you are a Tamil. And as a, an anti-caste activist and as anti-caste scholar, who has a very deeply lived in experience with caste-related discrimination. This particular bias troubled me a lot. And also it came from an authority in the sense that the person actually thought he was trying to prep me up. Um, <clears throat> the reason I'm sharing this very brief anecdote is because there's hardly any space in, you know, available in research and scholarly space that actually seriously takes up anti-caste issues, especially in the, in, in the technology domain. When data and society, I've been looking for such an opportunity. So when I came, came to know about data and society, when I came to actually in contact with, um, at the time with Sarita and then ex exchanged my interest. And the first uh, <clears throat> thought that came to my mind was, this is the place that at least acknowledges and recognizes the seriousness of this issue. So to me, this, uh, it was a very uh, easy, not only is the exciting moment to say, yes, I want to be part of data and society. So that's, that's my journey, what drew to this place. And it, it also offers a very unique space that combines academic rigor and innovative actionable research that cannot inform policy practitioners and shape and break of ongoing scholarly thinking on anti-caste issues. It doesn't force me to actually sit down in a corner and think quietly and write extensive obtrusive prose or texts. And lastly, but most importantly, I have to say about my colleagues here. Um, I mean, there is one thing that I've learned, uh, like Tiara said, um, it's a very eclectic group of fellows that I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be part of. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's brilliant. And, and also, every time I say something, they always have something to tell me to improve. Um, I can tell you, you know, especially with Tiara, uh, sorry, Tamara and, and Chas, every time I talked about uh, you know, how critical caste studies intersects critical race studies and law related issues. And I immediately got uh, lots of inputs from both of them saying that, hey, do read this, do read that, do, do, have, you, have, you, have you gone through that? So that's sort of a, a collegiate, like in sort of inspiring me, it's been extremely useful to me, particularly for me to actually look at, not just actually boggle down to my own uh, protected characteristics, but also kind of actually trying to understand where they come from and how am I going to take advantage of their thinking so that I can develop my own thinking and perspective so that we can actually work together. And um, more recently so, but more powerfully equally, um, Tiara, and I'm, I've, been, I've been reading her work, uh, Settler Colonialism and Data and so on, because I come from a particular point of view that, you know, you know anti-caste and data has got a very antagonistic relationship. We've been deprived of data. Whereas, you know, whereas Tiara actually comes from the point of view, how do we actually make use of data to empower, to articulate, 
our own you know, marginalities and so on and so forth. So to me, that actually informs me a lot of ways to actually go back and think more differently about it. So in a sense, I'm, 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 I always look forward to my Friday fellow meetings. And thanks for having me again. Yeah, and I, maybe I'll just round up by saying data and society can kind of set the table, but what really makes things shine, what makes for this incredible feast that we've all been partaking in are the fellows. And I, 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 the thing that I think we're gonna get into now is what happens when you bring fellows together who have this rich, deep expertise and experience in race, caste, and indigeneity, which I think is an extremely unique mix we don't get to do that a lot. Um, and so I'm just gonna pass the microphone right back to Murali, who's gonna you know, launch us on this discussion about settler colonialism and our approaches to our work. I'm more particularly keen to know that what does it mean to settler colonialism and data? I would like to kind of just link settler colonialism to data colonialism. Um, because that's where the concept of data colonialism comes from. Settler colonialism is the process of settlers taking over indigenous land and forcing the erasure of indigenous peoples, um, you know, off of that territory. And this expands into technological infrastructures as well. And that's something that I've been researching for a while. Um, but the, it's, you know, settler colonialism and data, data colonialism has been deeply inspired by Eve Tuck and Kei Wen Yang's work, um, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. And in this article, they speak a lot about, you know, how we can learn that settler colonialism removes indigenous peoples from their land, making them into ghosts. And this move is something that inhibits indigenous sovereignty within ontological, cosmolog cosmological and political systems. And this is extended online. And the way that this is extended online is through data mining extraction, which is called data colonialism. So in this way, you know, indigenous peoples have been removed from frameworks and therefore erased from present day recognition, clearly shown in data mining practices with the recent or, you know, you know, in 2019, the COVID-19 data categorization in the US of labeling indigenous peoples as other. This is just one example that amplifies the severe need to acknowledge and highlight how settler colonialism is ongoing as displayed in extractive data mining practices. Um, asking for ways in which indigenous peoples can take agency over their own data and therefore be recognized within larger structures that enable access to resources more generally. It is important to note that historical examples of settler colonialism continue to bleed into these present um, spaces outside of online categorization, um, but this is deeply tied to the extractive practices that started with land. So this is the tie between settler colonialism to data colonialism. Um, this idea of, or this very real concept of data colonialism inspired by or taken from settler colonialism leads us to IDS or indigenous data sovereignty. And there's a lot going on with indigenous indigenous data sovereignty in the states right now, more recently. Um, and indigenous data sovereignty or indigenous data is just data that encompasses information and knowledge about indigenous individuals, communities, entities, life ways, cultures, lands, and resources. Um, un unfortunately, too often this data on indigenous communities is mishandled. And this takes me to um, Eve Tuck's work on damage centered research, I think is what it's called. And in a way, indigenous data sovereignty is looking to assert indigenous voices into the extractive processes or against the extractive processes of data mining. Okay, that's, I have a question for Sarita. Um, Sarita, I'm actually keen to learn more about your recent and ongoing work on trustworthy infrastructures at that and society. And some basically some very basic questions, for example, that can help us understand the significance of your work. Um, can you just actually begin by saying that what exactly do you mean by trustworthy infrastructures and how and what will it look like? From what I understood, you emphasize that trust and safety related issues and safe inf information infrastructures, um, you kind of emphasize from minoritized communities perspective alongside existing 
platforms. So I just like to know more, know hear more from you about it, what that means. Oh, thank you. That those are great questions. So, um, I, I think in in my current research life, even beyond that, in my current life as a living, breathing entity on the planet, one of my biggest missions is just to flip the script, to flip the normal way we think about uh, lots of the problems that that we think about when we think about um, digital technologies. And so, one of the biggest ones is this question of trust and safety. We know that all the platform companies have within them trust and safety professionals. There are organizations dedicated to building trust and safety. Um, the words disinformation and misinformation bring to mind an entire ecosystem of information that essentially is deemed untrustworthy. Um, and all of these approaches to my approaches to my mind have one problem in common, one lacuna, lacuna and problem, which is that they are moving from the top down. So they, they all assume that the problems of how people can speak with each other online, but not only speak to each with each other, pursue economic livelihoods, um, get loans, uh, deal with bureau bureaucracies, they all assume that that relationship is going to be secured and made good, proper, or trustworthy by large-scale organizations, whether those are governments or corporations, and by a set of rules and regulations and practices that they put in place. But in fact, I think that we can see over and over again, and this comes up in Tamara's work and Chaz's work especially, uh, that those approaches really aren't working out very well for um, the people whom, whom I care about most, and those are the people who have been historically oppressed. So if you flip the script on this whole question, if you say, well, wait a minute, there have been lots of people all over the world who have been living within systems that don't work for them for a very long time, and ask, how is it that they still manage to do something, even if it's always compromised? then I think you get a much better empirical sense of what trust actually looks like when it's being built within communities. So that's the, the part one of, of what my approach is. So therefore, to me, that really helps me open up both the question of what trustworthiness can look like. We don't know in advance. I think a lot of the top-down approaches assume we know what trustworthiness is, or even why it's important or how it's important at all. It, they also assume that there's nothing good about mistrust. But as a matter of fact, for communities who have been historically oppressed, mistrust is an incredibly important, important diagnostic. And so we have to also look at how those moments in which a system uh, that is oppressive, that is racist, that is casteist, that is genocidal, um, how, how a mistrust of that system can lead to alternative modalities, uh, alternative ways to think about trust and also to think about what an infrastructure is. So to answer your question about what I mean by infrastructure, it's clear to me and it's probably clear to all of us today that um, online worlds are much more than just arenas for the exercise of some kind of of whatever kind. They're a lot more than a public sphere. Uh, they are places where people have to make a living. There are places where people interact with the justice system. There are places where people have to prove themselves worthy of credit. There are places where communities have to um, create their own data records of violence done against them. And, and the, all of those processes need kinds of infrastructures. And, and I, I both mean, you know, undersea cables, networks, electricity, <laughs> all of those material infrastructures, but they also need forms of uh, communicating that move us outside the norm. How do people talk to each other? What rules of engagement do they themselves produce? And so in, in my work leading this program, I'm trying to build a community of scholars who are located in um, in minoritized communities themselves, 
um, who can begin to look at these questions in a, in a robust empirical way. And as part of that, for my own project, I am working with um, activists in the Indian diaspora who, who variously identify as anti-caste activists, for instance, um, who, are, who identify as uh, progressive activists. And I'm trying to understand from them, how do they, for the work that they have to do in an extremely volatile, extremely surveilled space, how do they create safety for, for themselves and for others? And what I'm learning is it's as much about um, thinking through technical questions like what, uh, what communications channel, channel do you use, or even socio-technical questions like how do we teach cybersecurity? But it's also about developing um, new ethics towards what we want to see in the world. So, I, I, for instance, I've learned from Murali um, to think through uh, the, the concept of Maitri friendship, uh, which he reads in Ambedkar's work as a new way to interact in the world. And in my own reading of Ambedkar, I often think about this term manuski, the kind of humanity how to think through that. Um, so I see all around me in my, in my research and, you know, I'm an ethnographer, so I spend a lot of time, even virtually, just, just, talk, just talking, hanging out with people, thinking about what, what's important to them. And I ask them questions about what's the kind of ethics or philosophy that guides you. And so this is all very, um, very, very much ground up philosophizing. What are the concepts that people are actually deploying? And then how do they create spaces of security uh, and different ways of interacting with each other in an environment that they deem to be essentially insecure? I wanted to ask Chaz about your work. Um, you know, I think I have to just say, I've really enjoyed um, our conversations and our collaborations in terms of like some of our um, the panel we were on uh, a while back and just some of our shared interests and in kind of issues around race and criminalization. Um, and I'm just fascinated by your, you know, kind of professional biography because you've worked as a lawyer and then also you're now a law professor. And so mm -hmm. I know you think a lot about the connections between all these things. And you've been doing a lot of work on kind of big data and privacy and, and especially how it impacts black communities. And I'm struck by the way that you really foreground a conversation around slavery in it. And as you know, in the academy, sometimes people talk about race or they talk about racism or sometimes even now they're talking about anti-blackness, but the conversation of slavery sometimes kind of has this weird way of appearing and disappearing in some of these conversations. And so I was gonna ask you like, if you could talk more about your approach and your consideration of slavery as it relates to big data. Sure, yeah, and, and at some point I wanna, I, I, I didn't get a chance to chime in, but I wanna come back to, to, to ask Morley what he, what he meant when he called us an eclectic group. I wanna get at what he was really getting at there. Uh, so hopefully we can talk about that later. Uh, I think initially I, I never really thought of my work like consciously like con connected to like privacy, right? And, um, you know, and, I, and over the last couple of years, it's been more intentional, like I've been, uh, straying away from like privacy, uh, tr more traditional like privacy gatherings and like scholarly, you know, because it, uh, I, I think in many ways pri privacy is, is um, I, I don't know, it's sort of like bourgeois language and thinking and conceptualizing and, 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 and um, in many ways, you know, so when the, the things I've been um, most concerned about is like the harm you know, that, that people, people experience, right? And, and when, when you talk to people, they don't talk about their privacy being violated, right? They talk, they talk about what was done to them, right? They were, they were harmed um, either physically or emotionally in um, these ways. And I've been thinking about like, how, how does the law play into that? Um, and surveillance has been a big part of sort of connecting um, uh, both, you know, state and, and uh, private actors to being able to inflict like harms, right? So I've been thinking about how does how does criminal law, criminal procedures, constitutional uh, doctrine facilitate um, that continual harm and and, and subordination? 
Uh, but, you know, when I really think about it, like, you know, my work is squarely in the space of privacy. And I've, you know, I've been thinking more recently about, um, you know, race, race and privacy directly and sort of engaging um, with, with that field. And I think it's um, important. I think I had like a, you know, not too long ago, I had like a light bulb um, go off in my head. As, as you mentioned, um, you know, I, I teach criminal, criminal procedure. So, you know, I think about criminal law and doctrine. Um, I think about, you know, race and racial subordination um, issues. And, you know, I've been connecting all of this back to, um, you know, enslavement, because I think much of, at least in the criminal law space, I think a lot about the Fourth Amendment, right? And, and how that doctrine, um, how that constitutional amendment came about at a time when, you know, people, we had people who were, in, were enslaved, right? Um, and sort of, how they were locked out of that conversation about what privacy is and what privacy meant. Um, and, and I think it sort of reverberates throughout the years, right? So I, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example, of, and, and this is sort of shaping how I think about um, this now and connected to, to, to technology as, as, as well. Um, I teach my students about under, under the Fourth Amendment um, and Fifth Amendment, this idea of consent right, consent and like waiving, waiving your rights. Um, and in that, you know, you know, constitutional doctrine, when we talk about consent and we talk about, you know, what it, what it takes to waive your, your rights, we talk about like, you know, was it voluntary? Like, was it knowingly? Did you do it intelligently? Like, what were the circumstances um, in these ways that sort of, um, you know, legitimate these standards that that act to harm people of color, particularly black people. And like the cases, like uh, there's a case called Mendenhall, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a case called Wren, there's a case Perry v. Ohio, that some, you know, even some non-lawyers uh, know about. These standards are all built on, the, on, on cases dealing with black people and allowing law enforcement to, to go above and beyond uh, to control them, to violate them. Um, and and to uh, suppress them, right? And when I think about it in the data privacy context, the traditional frameworks are in the same way talking about consent, that they're talking about notice um, in this way that uh, not only legitimates uh, these standards, but uh, also facilitates that, that harm. Um, and I think part of the reason why we are um, in some ways stuck with these with these systems traces back to you know the the, the origins of our constitution and and, and uh, this country so I when I think about um, in, in enslavement I think about you know those um, you know natives people you know indigenous people like people who were enslaved if they had um, input on, in, into, into shaping um, you know the laws that that govern um, and sort of conceptualize like privacy, how would it be different uh, today, right? Like much of our fourth amendment, like law focuses on, you know, like this this notion that if it, you know, that that it's geared towards protecting you against state actors, right? Like government, right? When we know, you know, for the person who was enslaved at the time of the fourth amendment was a past, they, they their biggest concern wasn't the gov just the government, it was the you know the the, the private citizen who was uh, literally you know overseeing them, right? Um, you know, th there's also the notion that like you know, you give up your, uh, you know, privacy protections when, you know, more likely to give them up or not have them in public spaces. And it's, you know, that's just, that's just not reflective of, of you know, particularly, you know, people of color who are, you know, harassed, abused, um, you know, violated in, in, in very public ways and in public spaces. Um, so I think, um, you know, about elevating that that lens and elevating those narratives and, and, and elevating that um, perspective, not only as a way to sort of shift our thinking, but I think it's it's necessary to be able to agitate and challenge um, some of these standards, uh, some of these laws, some of these doctrines um, that you know I teach in, in crim law, but we need to to, to unmend them. So I, I sort of see my scholarship is sort of moving in that in that direction to be able to challenge that in the in the data and tech. Um, uh, spaces as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'm thinking about just, you know, the conversation we had last week um, when you and I co-curated and co-hosted a, um, a data bytes on the deified state, and you had said something that was very striking at the end about 
um, the different forms of resistance enslaved people engaged in, in terms of, you know, out in the open kind of speaking to each other to kind of stay off the radar, right? So what does it even mean? And, and it really makes me think, given what you're also saying here, like, what are even the ways we think about kind of um, resisting or kind of negotiating what some people have drawn as privacy, but other people think about as like trying to evade capture or trying to evade, you know, the threat of violence, right? And so I, I think you're, I, I'm really excited to see more of what you put out for us to think about regarding how to think about privacy in relationship to the history of slavery and, and data extraction. So thank you so much for that work. And that's been really meaningful for me to be, to hear you kind of think through that in this past year. And then we're gonna switch now to Merle. And Merle, you've been doing some really important work on digital cast and really, as you said, as an anti-cast activist, thinking a lot about kind of the discourse and about, you know, even the way that the conversation around it has been structured. And so you've been working a lot on developing a syllabus and, you know, really kind of getting us to think about what is our vocabulary for even thinking through this. And so if you could share more about your syllabus project, please. I'm going to highlight uh, three or four important points of why that's particularly crucial at this point of time. Um, I mean, I'm, I can only kind of uh, uh, refer you back to my original anecdote. So people are still actually under this sort of a uh, um, delusion that, you know, what, what, who represents what in terms of uh, uh, technological production of knowledge and so on and so forth. But more theoretically and conceptually, what I'd like to actually point out is that um, at least uh, the way that I argue, coming from the media, culture, communication, technology, disciplinary scholarship, I find it extremely disappointing that uh, caste has not been acknowledged yet as a communication analytic in the way that race, uh, queer sexuality, gender, and other protected characteristics have received sufficient, maybe not adequate enough, but at least have received some scholarly mention. And I can only say, I can really, I can definitely talk about, you know, I can, I'm fairly familiar with Hall's work and the way, the way that he interprets uh, race as culture and media and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, uh, that has not been the case with caste, um, even though <clears throat> caste is actually, as I argue, is constitutive of and constituted by everyday communicative practices. So whatever way that you look at caste as a part of a, a, as a discipline of political science, economy, psychology, uh, and uh, sociology, anthropology, and so on and so forth, the, the realization of caste, the it is always experiential. That experiential actually comes from communication and interactionism. So that means communications and communications technology as we speak. And therefore, it's particularly important to recognize that in that relationship. And it's so uh, shocking, but you could, you know, kind of surprising that that has not been made for lots of different reasons, which I'm kind of explaining into the syllabus, I'm not going to go in here. So that's one of the reasons, like, you know, the kind of a theoretical and scholarly reason. And the second thing is that um, we live in a, especially when it comes to digital technology and digital culture, cultures, we live in a globalized world. And as uh, Ambedkar famously said, Whenever a person from a caste affected society is moved to another parts of the world, the person also takes the he or she or they takes the caste with the person. And therefore, you can see now in the US, there's a lot of conversation happening about caste related discriminatory practices, not just actually in the general world, particularly in the in, in the in, in tech in the tech spaces as well. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I take this tech space as well very particularly serious because of my disciplinary interest. And I also think that caste is actually very particularly, you know, we can become virulent um, when you have an um, enabling communicative environment. So that's what it's waiting for it. As I always say that cost is actually, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a virus, it, it's waiting to happen. It's often, it's actually dormant. When it's dormant, people always think cost doesn't exist. No, it's always there, but it's waiting for the moment, like race or gender misogyny, any, any like every other protected category. The, the virus is it's always there in the space, 
in the out there waiting to happen, waiting to react. So we have to actually, so communication is the key. So that's the reason why I'm really, very, why I'm particularly fascinated by and interested in bringing out that relationship. And in particular, I'm, I just want to quickly moving on to three important points that we one should pay, one, that I'm paying attention to when, talk, when I talk about critical cost studies syllabus. The first is um, um, extension. So whatever that we are experiencing in the digital cultures in terms from uh, as a cost related, cost related discriminatory practices, it's nothing new. It's nothing but extension of what has been happening so long. It's been coming extended to online. Therefore, it's important to recognize what's happening in digital culture is not something new, but it's an extension. Therefore, we have to kind of understand, make this relationship. So that's one of the things that the syllabus is trying to make. So it's nothing that very unique what's happening in digital cultures, but digital spaces can amplify or sometimes empower anti-cost spaces as well. Mm -hmm. Then that calls for moderation and intervention. And there is no capacity at the moment in corporations to understand, you know, there is no understanding of cost. So therefore they lack capacities and powers and skills to mitigate cost related discriminatory practices or hate speeches. And we know on the other hand, the tech spaces are actively trying to shut down anti-cost voices. So that's another problem. So not only they lack capacities, but they are also extremely actively costist as well. So especially in, in digital online spaces, this is actually getting multifolded, multiplied, and normalized and naturalized. And that is something that we should not allow it to happen. After all, if you look at the, the, the traditional definition of untouchability is untouch, excommunicate. Again, it's all about Expression, expressions, interactions, and communication forms. Uh, and the last is remanifestation in digital uh, remanifestation of cost in digital cultures. That's another thing that I'm actually paying focus in the syllabus. And this is again not something exclusive to cost. This this is a, this is applicable to all sorts of protected characteristics. I have to say, for example. In one of the work that I'm currently, you know, the research piece that I'm currently engaging with, um, funded by Data and Society, is that we are looking at um, um, uh, <clears throat> platform economy that actually allows domestic maid servants to work for, you know, to earn their income and and work for <clears throat> uh, customers. And when you look at the back end of the this particular app, that app actually has. Um, details of these domestic maid servants. So when I say domestic maid servants, already it's actually a gendered platform. There is no space for other, other gender. So to, I mean, women, so women exclusive platform. And within that, they classify these women according to caste, education, where she comes from. So slum or non-slum, does she speak English or not? So you can see that how like these women are actually sociologically stereotyped profiled around caste and therefore it is also actually expressed and re-manifested in digital platform economy. So the question that some of the questions the syllabus is asking is that who's being disrupted by this disruptive technology and what actually constitutes disruption? Is the disruption actually gearing up to uh, re-manifest hierarchies? Is the disruption actually aimed to liberate the oppressed? So some of these questions I've been asking. So I think this is a very interesting starting point. I'm really thankful that I've got the space to work around this. And, um, and I have to say, for the first time, this syllabus is also uh, reviewed by 95% of the reviewers are Dalits, Adivasis, queers. So it's not by the usual suspects. It's by the people who actually have something to say. So I think um, um, we all can be proud of this work. I mean, it's not just my work. It's a very collective uh, contribution. Thank you. We are. I think we are. I, I mean, I, I think we are uh, impressed um, and, and proud of the work that you have been doing on this. Um, I, I think back to when the fellowship first began, and um, you know, Morley was talking about this is what I'm going to set out to do, and then like, I, I swear it was probably like the next week or something. He said, "I have 80 pages for you all to read, and you know, take a look at what I've been working on." So he's 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 brought such a you know, and, and intensity and, and, and passion for um, a huge gap, um, major area, um, uh, and that he is he is filling like magnificently, like it's incredible. And um, the approach that uh, morally you you brought um, to developing, um, you know, the syllabus is, is impacted how I think about you know developing my classes and, and how to build out and how to be a better 
um, an instructor myself. Um, and, I, you know, one of the good things is this past year I've had Camera and both Morley uh, come and join my uh, my racing tech class. So, um, you know, wink, wink for next year. Um, I'm looking at uh, Tiara and, and, and uh, Theresa uh, to, to join my classes. Um, as as well, um, but I want to I want to take a a, a, a pivot, um, and I forget what we were discussing in our in our group meeting, and and, and morally said uh, it was something along the lines of not being worried about us because he he knew he knew our heart, right? And um, you know the, the the idea that you know although we come from different um, you know focus areas and and um, you know topics that we are uh, focused on uh, part of um, you know, the, the beauty of us in this, in being in this fellowship has, has been being able to be in a space with people where we don't have to worry about what agenda they have, right? Or what, what sort of perspectives that they're, um, that they're bringing to the, to, to the work. And I think that's um, incredible. And, and, and along those lines, one of the things that has been great for me and what we have done is we've all had like, you know, issues around sort of the, the traditional methodology. Uh, that we're locked into within our uh, specific fields, right? And um, a lot of those methodologies and, and ways of knowing and ways of, of practicing and, and, and ways of agitating are steeply stoked in like white supremacist thinking and, and, and ideology. Um, so I, I think on, you know, when I say I'm tired, like, I, I, you know, much of our work has been trying to break and fit ourselves in, into those uh, methods, right? And into those ways of of sharing our, our, our ideas uh, in, in, in ways and in us trying to share our heart <laughs> uh, in, in many ways. But I think there's another side of sort of thinking about methodology as well, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's the frustration that we feel and, and, and trying to fit in these boxes and molds, but then there's the, um, you know, the, the, the reality that, you know, there are certain skills uh, that we need to build in, 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 in the area of thinking about methodology and knowing and, and sort of pushing. Um, and, you know, we can ask, how do we, how do we build some of those skills in, in ways that can make us more effective advocates, make us more effective um, community members, more effective um, scholars? And, uh, you know, one of the, the things that I've been, um, you know, admiring that, that, that Tamara has had that at the, at the forefront of her mind, right? So how do we how do we build these skills? How do we how do we use this, even if we have to break ourselves into these different, you know, modalities to to sort of get these ideas out there and sort of push back against these oppressive systems? Like how do we build skills to be able to to to, to navigate um, that terrain? So I wanted to I wanted to ask um, Tamara, like, you know, why did you choose um, to focus on strengthening your your method skills um, during your, your fellowship uh, year and um, how do you think that will uh, strengthen your work, uh, particularly your work on, on credit scoring? So for me, just on a very basic level, you know, I, I think a lot about like the way that I think non-white people sometimes get exotified in terms of knowledge. Like there's sometimes this assumption that like, you know, because we experience oppression that we are therefore skilled in kind of mapping how these systems operate or institutions operate. And this is not to take away from kind of, you know, um, what we learn from kind of navigating these systems, but, you know, we don't always know like actually like who's running what and what money flowed where and, 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 you know, what are the networks and so forth and, and things that to me are kind of basic aspects of like power analysis. And I also came from an activist background. I was, I worked for a community organization was involved in different social justice activist orgs in um, when I was in grad school. And I remember years ago, like going through power analysis training where we had to think about like, you know, here's our target, you know, who are the stakeholders? Who do we think we can move? But like also, you know, a lot of social justice campaigns they go through training on like how to kind of analyze, you know, like how power to, mapping, power right, mapping, power mapping, right? And and so there's stuff where I just think that that's really important kind of skill work, right? Whether it's done by academicians or research organizations or individuals or community groups or grassroots groups, and sometimes I feel like, you know, I remember years ago 
saying something, you know, like I posted something on Twitter about like, you know, it was a quote where somebody said, you know, how can we fight neoliberalism if a lot of us don't know how kind of Wall Street operates or the Federal Reserve and this and that. And some people like push back and they're kind of like, why do we even need to know that? It was like, okay. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, but, you know, I actually think this is useful for us to get trained in these skills. And as a sociologist, you know, I, I teach methodology. I teach the I teach basically advanced research methods, which is the second part of kind of the two part research methods requirement. And so, you know, I'm familiar with like different research method skills, but for what I'm trying to understand in terms of, um, you know, the capitalist and the people in power and kind of the way that the state um, doesn't really kind of regulate some of these institutions, right? Um, and some of these companies, you know, I just really realized I had to level up my skills, right? You know, and when I was at first thinking about doing some interviews and this and that, I realized I had some meetings with some people who work for like, you know, think tanks in DC, and they were talking on a level that I had not seen in a lot of the scholarship, even as much as it's scholarship that I respect and that I'm trying to be in conversation with. And they're talking on this kind of policy, you know, kind of who's moving what and like what was behind the scenes and all this stuff. And I realized that like before I could really kind of do the type of study that I'd want to do, I had to kind of level up my own methodology. And so for me, you know, this comes from kind of also my my approach to data literacy. Like I'm a really big advocate for data literacy. I think it's very much a social justice issue, but a lot of people who do data literacy, and this is no shade, right? They, they associate with either like numeracy, like getting people just to be comfortable with numbers, right? Or they associate with just like, you know, you know how to kind of, you know, uh, do data stuff. But to me, I'm always thinking about like political economy and power analysis. And there's a lot of skill building that I felt like I need to do if I really wanted to target in my analysis and you get a better handle on kind of how these power systems operate and to make it less abstract. And I'm influenced a lot by actually, um, this is no shade to like the sociologists. Yeah, you know, they do some really important work, but like, like I'm influenced by a lot of the kind of people who took data literacy seriously for organizing reasons. So I think about like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and they had a research department. And Julian Bond said, you know, I, like this quote is just such a beautiful quote, but he says, you know, for the SNCC's research department, he said, you know, the, the, the um, like basically the, the power system was not an abstract concept. He said, we had lists of who owned what, where their finances were, what properties they controlled, all these networks, right? Like, you know, so they went into these spaces just kind of more armed with like all this kind of information, right? And so for me, that's kind of the tradition I want to be a part of. And I feel like it's a really important part. So I've done a lot of kind of data literacy, political ed, I've done different talks. And I find that there are just a lot of people who are concerned about issues I'm concerned about, whether it's credit scoring or the financial system and how it's ravaging us or the criminal punishment system. And a lot of those conversations are happening at the level of data. So when we think about like crime data, crime data is a big tool of propaganda. So to me, data literacy is an abolitionist issue, right? But it's, you know, even then, like I want to be able to kind of have the skill set. So the reason why I pivoted to kind of thinking about methodology is I remember it was actually Sarita who said, well, why don't you maybe hire a tutor? And I was like, oh, cool, right? Maybe I'll do that. But then I started thinking about it and I thought, well, I could either use my own research budget for it, or I could see if the organization would sponsor it. And then it wouldn't just be me getting trained. Maybe it could be a whole bunch of us getting trained, right? And, you know, so I went to Jenna Burrell, who is the research director um, here at Data and Society. Um, and I said, is this something you'd be interested in? She said, I've been thinking about something like this too in relation to the datafied state. So we've had like several meetings, right? Um, and then also Sierra Dissimore has gotten involved. And so she is a co-organizer of this methods workshop series, right? And I'll just say this very quickly. Like one of the things I think I, you know, one of the things I appreciate about this fellowship is like, I appreciate so much the camaraderie and the humor and the kind of exchanging of ideas and the space that we've created. And Sarita has played a really big role in that. But I also appreciate that Sarita like had all of these like different people in the organization come and meet with us regularly. Because one thing I'll say for me at least 
is that even though we're fellows and we're not like staff and so forth, which I'm fine with, right? Is that, you know, we got plugged into the organization a lot of ways and data and society was always kind of, you know, different people were letting us know, like if you wanted to talk about your research with us or if you want to have a meeting or, you know, there was the Slack channel and haha. <laughs> but anyways, but the thing is, you know, that opened up these channels though, for me to kind of be able to, you know, know who Jenna was and to kind of email her directly, right? And to kind of feel comfortable doing that. So that's something I appreciate about like what Sarita helped create for us, right? And that's where my work went. But really, honestly, I just want to level up. Like I felt my work had hit a ceiling of where I could go analytically. And I'll be honest, I could probably fake the funk and still look smart but I, it wasn't real to me after a certain point, right? Like I was like, do I wanna just keep producing the same thing? And I haven't leveled up my like skill set, right? So one of the things I'm just so excited about this methodology series, it's really coming to shape, right? I'm just really excited about the work Jenna and Sierra and I have done on it. But it's also just, I feel like I'm gonna get stronger and I'm just a big fan of getting stronger as much as I can. And I also just feel like I can bring that strength to my thinking, to my research and my scholarship, to my teaching back at the college, right? Like I'm really excited to bring this stuff to the classroom and I'm excited to bring it to political ed, right? To my political ed work because, you know, and I'll just end with this, right? You know, sociology has tended to study poor people and working class people. And this goes to some of these issues of privacy, right? Because they're just more readily available right? And they have less power to protect themselves a lot of times from being kind of analyzed and scrutinized and picked apart, right? And for me, you know, and if you look at a lot of the research, the elites really don't get studied very seriously in terms of like really kind of picked apart and analyzed and being able to trace their movements and stuff, right? Yet they structure so much of our lives and, and just like the, you know, terribleness of our lives. And they're the ones we need to target with our analysis and politics, right? This is my perspective. So this to me is also consistent with kind of some of my political critiques of my discipline of sociology and of just how kind of you know, you don't really get trained in document analysis to read things like patent applications and SEC filings and lobbying and so forth. So I'm just really excited about where I think this skills training will take me. I'm just very excited and what I can hope to share with others. That's, I mean, that's an, an incredibly, incredibly um, profound um, on so many different levels, so many um, points you, you, you hit upon and that, that last point about the, the the elites and you know being able to to, to dodge sort of the the introspect you know the the the, the microscope of it in some way being placed upon them and being picked apart is is um you know it, it makes me think about what you know drew me into the work that you know I'm, I'm focused on in, in terms of surveillance right and it, it comes from like the real experience of being like under the microscope and never fully um just existing in my body, right? Just, just always constantly worried about like, you know, who's watching, what, you know, how, um, you know, my own vulnerability, right? And and how being under the microscope, under the telescope, um, sort of, you know, makes me feel. And I'm always sort of like consciously thinking about how do I, how do I move and exist in this world? Um, how am I being controlled? And 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 those things. And you know, I, I, I you know, I want to sort of big up uh, another point you you mentioned about data literacy and and its connection to to, to abolition and that I, I think uh, you know another point um you know to, to go along with that I, I i think um for a lot of folks you don't even think about some issues as being like a data issue right we like being connected to, to to data so i think that's something um you could bring as well, and I, I'll say that the the I, I like the theme of this fellowship year is leveling up because uh, mm -hmm. I think we all have been doing that um, in our in our own ways, and 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 certainly um, I, I want to say as well like the, the points you were making about Sarita, like none of this in this pandemic virtual space would 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 happen without her being an architect mm -hmm. um, and sort of guiding and leading us through because it's it's hard and it's it's you know, to, to, to do a fellowship with an organization and, and you know, in this virtual way, right? Um, so uh, Sarita has done a, a tremendous job in sort of keeping us uh, together and on point and helping us all level up um, in many ways. Uh, but I want to I wanna draw um, uh, Tiara into this, this conversation as well, because I know you think about um, 
you know, methodology um, as, as, as well. So I wanted to pose a question to you about, um, you know, what do anti-colonial methodologies mean for you? And I know you, that's something that you um, think about a lot. So if you could talk about that and sort of speak to, um, you know, methodologies and how you wrestle with that in, in your work or plan to in your work. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much, Chaz. And I, you know, I can echo a lot of what you and Tamara have both shared. I mean, first of all, just like the exhaustion of trying to fit into a structure or a sphere that um, enables or pushes productivity within like academic and, and learning knowledge production, learning production, and production just in general. It's exhausting to do that, to be, to feel like you're forced to do that within um, a space built by white supremacists, you know, um, institutionally and, and method methodologically speaking. And also with you, Tamara, I agree, like as well, like with thinking about, or I can echo what you're saying in terms of leveling up or expanding your research or your work. It's like kind of the only way is to think about, for me at least, new methodologies or anti-colonial methodologies. And this question is actually quite personal for me, like in terms of like my indigeneity and my experience and in, in, in the world just in general. And, and I remember a moment I was giving a talk, I think at Cambridge, it was one of my first talks like ever. And I was talking about kind of the impossibility of, you know, existing as an indigenous person online, like in a safe way, because I was arguing that digital infrastructures and digital territory has already um, been colonized. And I felt really good about the talk, you know, and after, after the talk, this person um, raises their hand and asks me, um, well, you know, what methodologies are you going off of? Like, what is this, where, where are you getting your work from? How is this happening? And I was kind of shook, like I was struck because I was like, excuse, this is intuitive. And plus this is not only intuitive, this is the only way forward for someone with my, my thinking and, and my work and my scholarship. Like in, in a way she, <clears throat> this person was positioning me to respond with the methodologies of the Western world, right? And I, because I was so shook, I felt it in my body, I, I could only respond intuitively. And that's something, you know, that I've kind of been guided with or led with in the trajectory of my work and thinking around methodologies and around writing and critique um, is intuition. And so if I'm thinking about an anti-colonial methodology, what does my intuition say about it? Well, I have to start with the body. And what is my body saying? And, and what does my body need in terms of decolonization or anti-colonialism, right? And that takes me back to Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang's work on decolonization is not a metaphor. And I really lean into the impossibility of decolonization because there's so much work written about decolonize the institute or decolonize this and, and or decolonize land and give land back to indigenous communities. But I'm like, that's already scarred with, with settler colonialism. All of this is breathing settler colonialism. So what is a, a refusal of that rather than a, a way to decolonize that? And so I work a lot with my term that I've been, you know, trying to, um, work in data visualization to, you know, methodologies, performance art, et cetera, which is the decolonial gesture. And the decolonial gesture is an embodied acknowledgement of the impossibility of decolonization. So if I could then take this embodied, like, acknowledgement of the impossibility of decolonization toward or into thinking about anti-colonial methodologies, then I lean into <clears throat> Alexis Pauline Gums, who says that the body is a, a practice of ceremony. And if the body is, is a practice of ceremony as an indigenous person, then how can I think about methodologies as tradition, as ceremonial, as rituals, um, rather than um, critical thinking, for example, which is something that I learned in grad school 
a long time ago, it, it was uh, one of the first research methodologies that um, I was given to, to work with. Um, so I think, you know, I, I don't have a specific answer, but the only way I could respond to you is by sharing the process in which I think about anti-colonial methodologies, which starts at the decolonial gesture, which comes from the body and intuition. And intuition tells me that I need to go back to ceremony and ritual and practice. And the process that I'm in right now is how do I rewrite or write methodologies without appropriating indigeneity in general or indigenous cultures, indigenous thinking, indigenous practice? Um, how do I do that as like a Tadaskan Mestiza? And I have to follow the red line of my own lineage. I have to speak to my grandmothers. I have to follow the, the grandmother medicine, right? On both sides. And, and, and I think, even as I'm saying that, like medicine can also be an anti-colonial methodology, but we have to really situate what medicine is and what medicine means. But what does medicine mean for my lineage? I mean, I thought that I, I thought that was um, was beautiful, right, and, and 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 powerful, right. And no, and I, I think you sort of and, and sort of laying that out. I think that we we hit both of those. Uh, there's probably a couple of different other branches that we could go in and sort of thinking about methodology, but both sort of um, being able to recognize, um, you know, what it what it takes to, you know, fit ourselves and break ourselves. I, and when I say that, I'm thinking about this, I, I probably should say that when I keep saying break ourselves, I, I'm thinking about um, Brian, Brian Stevenson, um, uh, who's a lawyer, um, they had a movie about him <laughs> not too long, not too long ago, Michael B. Jordan played, uh, plays him. Um, but, you know, one of the things he says is, you know, he talked about working in the, the criminal legal system. It's sort of like, you know, these, these systems are, um, are oppressive and, you know, and, and um, you know, harmful in so many ways that like to be able to go, you know, go into them. Well, he says, first, you have to get close. You have to get close to, to, to be able to do effective work. You have to be able to get close. I mean, that's getting closer to the people who are the most, most harmed in these systems. And to go into these systems, you have to break yourself. Right. And this work is like sort of you break yourself. Right. So I think one side of methodology is sort of like you're to do this work. You have to you have to break yourself in, 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 um, in many ways. But how do you how do you break yourself and stay whole at the same time? Right. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think the, the, the other side um, is sort of what what Tamara was speaking to, like, you know, in, in that process, like what, what skills do we need? Right. Like how do we how do we level up even even in this, this process of. Uh, uh, breaking ourselves while trying to stay whole. So I, I think y'all both um, hit on hit on those notes beautifully. Yeah, that's the part of leveling up, I guess. <laughs> we can follow. Um, yeah, that's and also Chaz, I just wanted to respond and and just thank you for for this this. Now I'm thinking about like breaking and and staying whole simultaneously or or living through the rupture, riding through the rupture. It's exhausting. It's really, really exhausting. Um, so thanks for sharing that. And so yeah, I just wanted to pass this on to Sarita and, and Mirali and and how you both are thinking about anti-colonial methodologies or um yeah, anti-coloniality in, in the work that you are doing right now. Uh, thanks, Tiara, for asking this question. I think it's a great question. Um uh, kind of a in many ways sums up uh, the reason why I'm here at DNS. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, uh, any anti-caste work is essentially um, inherently anti-colonial work and uh, is distinctively different from uh, widely acknowledged uh, subaltern projects or decoloniality or decoloniality. And I'd like to take just a minute to expand this point uh, I think an anti-caste perspective problematizes Western sociology, whether decolonial or not, Western sociology traditions that tend to homogenize heterogeneous set of practices in caste-affected societies. Just to give you an example, um, you know, if you look at uh, uh, most caste-oppressed person from caste-affected societies, and this person's uh, a colonizer need not be uh, the, the white person, so to put, put very bluntly. Uh, 
the, the, the colonizer can be someone who's actually at the, immediately at the cost oppressive structure of the oppressor. So we are taught, so what we are witnessing in the United States at the moment, when people actually from move, emigrate from cost affected societies to the United States, which is the land of freedom, and yet there they suffer from, yes, thank you, Jess. Um, yet there they suffer from um, 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 oppression and coloniality, not necessarily, not only from um, the, the, the in racist terms, but most intensely from their own fellow cast affected, cast um, dominant cast group members. So this is what I mean by anti-coloniality. So if you look at anti-cost literature, there are some of the things that uh, that 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 anti-scholars scholarship engages with. It's quite actually um, uh, different from the so-called Eurocentric methodology, so to speak. I mean, one of the things that I would uh, I would actually go back to what uh, both Tamara and Chaz were actually talking about in, in light of uh, Chaz's work on privacy. Privacy is a very interesting concept when, it, when you actually view that concept from Antikos perspective, because privacy is actually, I mean, I'm sure this is, a, this is the same with many other protected characteristics such as race, gender, sexuality, but I'm just talking about where I that I'm more familiar with, the terrain that I'm familiar with. So you're looking out from uh, Antikos perspective, Privacy is actually, it's never, a, it's a privacy is always seen as a privilege, number one. And privacy is also seen as, a, a, you know, if you look at it from an anti-caste perspective, exclusion is not privacy and ostracizing is not privacy. And privacy is actually, if you look at the existing debate, it's often actually narrated in terms of me the meta narratives often, often in tech deterministic terms, especially recently in the last 20, 15, 20 years. Even the personal space and identity is actually looked at and articulated from tech data meta point of view. But viewed from anti-caste perspective, it is all about cultures, respect, identity, and dignity point of view. So what actually translates into privacy is extremely important. And for me, in, in, in my own syllabus, in my own research as well, what, so I like to unsettle this sort of oft taken for granted Western notions of privacy. And I'd like to view that from privacy culture's point of view. Um, I mean, I'm sure that if you speak to someone from um, um, North African, Arab, Mediterranean countries, and if you ask that person somewhere, like, like say, especially women or um, um, oppressed gender, uh, you know, if you ask someone about what constitutes privacy to them, they might be completely different from what we articulate. So I, just, just to give you an example, what that means, how that intersects with technology terrain, India has, for example, a biggest uh, uh, biometric program called Aadhaar. And if you look at other, it's, 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 it's causing a huge amount of controversy because it violates privacy, it's intrusive, it is a survival techno surveillance, and you know that the, the, the uh, exhibit 101 Western argument about privacy, surveillance, trust, safety issues, so on, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But now, when I was in the field work, when I was talking to uh, some of the most oppressed cause group members, and there the government representatives came to that particular colony, which is a slum, um, uh, where most oppressed people live. Um, and then there they came to collect details and identity, collect information about these people. And I, I was talking to them, I was living there at the time. So I was asking them, do you not feel, do you not have any concerns about safety, privacy, surveillance? And the quick response came, came from them was, what are you talking about? This is the first time state even acknowledges our existence in this land. We don't even, until now, the state doesn't even bother that we actually exist here. Now we at least have a car to actually assert our entitlements. This is not, I'm not saying it, I'm not making this argument to actually uh, uh, dismiss all arguments against other. That's not my intention. My intention is to actually, how Antikos perspectives unsettles established Western notions of communications and technology related concepts and theories. So that's about privacy. In the same way, if you look at the idea of openness, you know, the notion of open society, open government, open net, and all, and so on and so forth. If you look at open, it can be prefixed to at least 15 sociological concepts. <clears throat> but then the question I'd like to ask is that is open, does open really mean the idea, the real utopian, borderless, universe borderless openness, transparency? Or the, is that what we're talking about? Or is the idea of openness is actually a realization because we know there is a structure there out there existing in the society, which is full of closure. In that sense, open is another form of structure. It's another structural form. 
So as long as open is another structural form, it is not open to the minoritized communities. So, you, so anti-colonial approach viewed from anti-cost perspective, it hugely problematizes the taken for granted Western notions around the liberatory, liberalist fantasies around openness, privacy, empowerment, inclusion, participation, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I think therefore uh, anti-colonial methodology is very important and it is inherently present in anti-cost work, number one. That's, that's a grand point I want to make. And, and the second point, I'm, I'm actually going back to what Tamara said, I'm inspired by her work on methodology because it, it also echoes in my work as well because anti-cost work does not actually, is not, uh, is not actually determined or it's not actually particularly obsessed with a particular type of a, a methodology or a particular type of a logic driven uh, methods and concepts and theories. It is actually driven by values and humanities. So that's the kind of a central ideology of political solidarity. So therefore, that's the reason anti-cost scholar activity, anti-cost movements, if you look at it, they actually supported at some point the British Empire. They did not go with Gandhian, so-called Gandhian movement, freedom independent movement. At some point, they supported um, uh, and still do, they support globalization. Whereas a, a liberalist will actually take up Puritan and a point of position and say globalization actually advances capitalism. Yes, and therefore anti-cost perspective at times actually supports capitalism as much as it actually wants to engage with socialism. So it's a very, the, 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 the movement itself is, it may appear to be inconsistent if you come from Eurocentric methodology point of view, but actually it is not because it is essentially anti-colonial, anti-casteism. That's at the center of the methodology. So that is why I feel that anti-coloniality is extremely keen because it is extremely embedded with anti-casteism work. That was an amazing answer. I feel that like we could just end the conversation there, but I think what I wanna just contribute to what all has already been said by Tiara and Woodley on anti-coloniality um, it's a, a small reflection on history. So for me, I, I'm often in spaces, getting to this point of, of spaces where we, we feel exhausted. I'm often in spaces where um, people are listening to accounts of what a particular idea or concept looks like from a particular location. For instance, what Murali just said about the history of the of globalization and the Indian independence movement uh, and British colonialism, and they they sort of um, they throw up their hands and they say, "Okay, well, we feel like there's hope. Things are hopeless." And I think for me that's an extremely narrow and unhelpful point of view, and it points out some some of the problems of coloni colonizing methodologies in which history is always linear, politics is always about elections. And there's always a shared endpoint and goal. But in fact, we live in a world that's full of, you know, we said before, eclecticism as a positive value. Um, alterity might be a way to put it. And so my, my methodology, the, the place where I start from, is to try to think about those kinds of differences and make this gesture of refusal to try to commensurate them all. Uh, you know, Tiara's liberation is not the same as my liberation. So how do we work through that to come to a place of, uh, of solidarity, where we're working together, where we're, we're picking up uh, when one of us feels exhausted, another of us can pick up and move that person's, you know, project forward. That's the, that's the kind of methodology that I approach my work with. And, um, you know, one thing I want to say is that I think we often think of methods as a specific set of tools. Um, and, and I think the tool is a great metaphor to think with, but only if we think about all the aspects of that that tool, the, the tool's concept, the, the phrases that we use when we think about the tool, the tool's language, its heft, its weight, um, and that we're constantly expanding to how we think about that tool and the others that we can add to it. I think that's the kind of leveling up piece that we've all been talking about. But for me, there's also this really important rooting down, you know, grounding down into histories that have been erased 
past moments of um, rethinking the world that get buried when we try to collapse everything into a hit into a particular word, even a word like anti-colonial. Um, so how can we always be humble vis-a-vis um, -vis our own methodologies? And when we listen to the approaches and methodologies of others, I feel that we always just, you know, the, the gesture, right, to use Tierra's words, the gesture that's necessary is always to refuse assuming we understand and assuming all of these terms that we're deploying and all these approaches that we're using are actually about the same thing in the end. Uh, that to keep open, keep open that space for different projects of liberation. Um, I think we need to wind up this conversation, which is really sad for me, but I, I see uh, CJ very kindly keep changing the time on my final remarks. <laughs> I think we've hit that time. So, you know, as a final question, one thing I'd maybe like to ask to bring the backstage to the front stage a little, how do we exhaust the exhaustion? I'd love to hear from everybody, you know, what's one memory you have of our time together? Uh, or what's one thing that you came away with from our Friday meetings of, of how we exhaust that feeling of exhaustion and, and, and bring us to another space or a place? Because we did a lot more of these meetings than just talk about uh, anti-colonial methodologies and, you know, the, the long impact of the history of enslavement on how we think about privacy. So, you know, I've only been here for a few months with you all. I'm so grateful that you've welcomed me into the weekly meetings. I obviously was very intimidated at first. I still am because you are all so impressive and leveled up, um, but also just so inspiring to me. And I think the way of exhausting the exhaustion for me has just been not only the community that I have felt with you all in such a, a way that I haven't in years because I'm in Germany. I'm, I've been, you know, doing uh, research in the German Institute, which is very different. And so to also have that feeling of community from Berlin remotely with you all has been incredible, but the laughter for me has, yeah, been the most that I, I'm, I, I'm always looking forward to it every week. And now I'm going to be very bummed to not have it um, moving forward. I mean, w w one thing I, I have a few points actually, because coming from the other side of the pond, um, um, I was quite nervous about the, um, um, I, would, I would be lying if I wasn't uh, nervous about the work culture. And, um, you know, this is a, though it is remote, this is the first time I'm working with people, um, if I'm allowed to say Americans, uh, or, you know, pe or people living in the US, let me put it that way. Okay. Um, so, it was very, it was very nerve wracking, um, and I'm, um, uh, but I have to say, I felt safe. I think that's particularly important. I, it's, it's a, especially in this particular space. Uh, I, I early on, I was. It's not that everyone assured me, but early on, through your actions, made me feel it's okay to be just yourself. That's fine. And that to me, it's a, a great thing. I mean, that's actually going back to what Sarita was talking about, trust related infrastructure, human infrastructure. You know, it, it does, it's not always nuts and bolts. It's just the way that um, uh, we come across, we, we kind of uh, um, uh, talk to each other, listen to each other. So I would highly put that as a, my top priority. And, and as, as Tierra said, I've always looked forward to, and I always do still until the day it ends, look forward to this Friday fellow meeting. And yes, there was an instance of frustration sometimes, but um, I think uh, it's important to say that I've received, uh, um, especially from Sarita, I received a, a really, really, um, um, you know, great support so so i think that to me again kind of confirms that you know if you if you are if you're in the right um uh, if you're with the right colleagues you know that's amazing so i think I, I i cherish this space actually so i'm grateful to the team i'm grateful to the team and as i said you know this is something that we are united by our values um it's such a safe space so you know i really hope to be in touch with all of you yeah thank you and I'll just jump in and add when I when, when I mentioned, you know, being um, 
tired before it was it was more a reflection of like you know um talking about being tired and as as in creating a launch pad right so i think about like um fanny lou hamer you know when when she said i'm sick and tired of being sick and tired but it, it wasn't about like physical exhaustion it was it was more like a, a rallying uh cry you know so i think i think you exhaust the exhaustion right the exhaustion not you know uh in, in in that sense by you know building community by organizing um you know and 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 sort of putting putting heads minds bodies uh together to to, to fight back and to to resist in whatever way that you can and then you know I've, I've been thinking a lot about um i think it was last last week the the, the time um put out a series of articles about um haiti Right, and I, I've been thinking a lot about the the Haitian, you know, revolution, um, you know, and there's there's been a you know ton of different sort of podcasts and conversations and and other articles that it's spilled out of um, that New York Times uh, focus. But I, I, you know, I I think part of you know what what led it was certainly sort of the, the French Revolution that created an, a, a window to to sort of uh, people to come together and push and sort of the the, the turn. Uh, the, that oppressive system upside down, but I, I think it was sort of like, like we're tired, right? Like it, it you know, um, not that we don't have the the energy, because they certainly had the energy to, to sort of uh, kick kick the French out in this, you know, in the, in the in this revolution. But sort of like, you know, what I am continuing to to, to give to this, uh, I'm done with that, right? And I I, I think. Um, that could be a point to like a launch pad to something like you know very beautiful, very um, active um, in, in in many ways. So I, I I think the point of saying I'm 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 done with this. I'm done thinking about this work in this way. Like I'm done having these the same conversations with these people who don't really have interest in uh, the perspective that I bring. Like I'm I'm done sort of reading. Uh, the same articles over and over again that don't incorporate narrative, that don't bring in, um, you know, the, the fact that history is dynamic um, and not linear, as, as Saria was talking about. And that's, I, I think you exhaust the exhaustion by um, sort of um, finding other uh, like-minded um, in, in, in that way. And I think we've done that in this in this space. So I'm happy to have been a part of it. And one of the, you know, one thing I've taken away from this is that, you know, as Tamara, Tamara mentioned to be in fellowship uh, with, with, with us, I, I don't see it ending. It's not. It can't end. In, it can't end this month, right? So I, I have to be in fellowship with you all uh, for for some more time, and that that that'll be turning to you all, remaining in communication, and and continuing to build. So I look forward to that. Thanks, everybody. This is an amazing conversation, and I'll just add um, one of the most amazing things to me about this conversation is that even though we've never met each other we've all showed up with our quirks, um, our food loves and hates. I think a big part of, um, you know, not, not, not being in trauma with each other, but being in, in joy with each other, creating these spaces that, uh, that don't feel like a repetition of the same, is that we manage to share so much of our embodied selves, you know, who's on Instagram, who doesn't know what Instagram is, what we like to eat, what we absolutely can't abide, where we like to be outside, where we like to be inside. It's just been an amazing, uh, an amazing space um, because in our academic lives, there are so few spaces where we can bring all of that, mm -hmm. um, all of that backstage presence to bear. And we don't have to perform our given role. Um, that, that for me, it's been incredibly nourishing and it's been a huge privilege to spend the time with all of you. Uh, so I'm just going to end by saying a huge, huge thank you to all the fellows and to tell everyone at Hope that we'll share this conversation and supporting resources at Data Society.